truth of the matter is that most people don't realize that the majority of people suffer their first major heart attack on Monday morning between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. People getting ready to go to jobs that they don't like, jobs that are making them sick. What is it that you could love doing seven days a week that will bring a smile to your face? <laughs> Think about that. You've got to start saying yes to your life. You've got to start saying yes to your dreams, yes to your unfolding future, yes to your potential. Les Brown's business is changing lives. He touches thousands of people each year. He talks to Fortune 500 companies and to personal development groups about how to find success and fulfill your dreams. In essence, his best message is himself, because Les Brown knows what it is to have come up the hard way. Les and his twin brother were adopted at the age of six weeks by Miss Mamie Brown, a single woman with little money and a big heart. The boys grew up in the low-income area of Liberty City outside Miami, Florida. In the fifth grade, Les was mistakenly labeled EMR, educably mentally retarded, and he became a child nobody thought would amount to anything. After making it through high school, Les set out to prove them wrong. He started on the radio, moved to Ohio, and made himself a local star as a fast-talking disc jockey. He soon became an influential community spokesman. Then he ran for the Ohio State Legislature, where he served three terms and became chairman of its Human Resources Committee. Les Brown is now a nationally acclaimed motivational speaker who's taught thousands of people the techniques he's used to overcome the obstacles he's faced in his own life. guys look like you're ready. <laughs> Repeat after me, please. This is my decade. This is my decade. You know, every year I used to say, this is my year. But ladies and gentlemen, one good year won't be enough for me. How many of you can use a good decade? Raise your hands, please. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, now, here's what I want to do. I want to share with you how you can begin to make this your decade. How many of you know within yourself, if you ask yourself the question, have I done all that I'm capable of doing or being and living up to my potential? How many of you have to really answer, no, I have not done all that I can do? Raise your hands, please. Okay, very good. Now, here's what we know. That people don't do what they know in life, but what they do is they operate within the context of the vision they have of themselves. So what I want to share with you is how to begin to get a larger vision of yourself and how to begin to make this your decade. Because in order to do that, it's going to be very challenging. It's going to require a lot of work on your part, an ongoing process of personal and professional self-mastery. And it's going to require that you begin to see yourself worthy of the requirements in terms of effort, in terms of commitment, in terms of action, in terms of preparation, or whatever it is that you need to do in order to take your life where you want to take it. So one of the first things I ask you to do is I want you to look at your life right now. And think about something that's important to you, something that gives your life a sense of value. Think about something that you'd like to have, or something you'd like to create for you or your family or for society. I want you to hold this thought in mind. Now, one of the first things I want you to do is don't worry about the inner conversation that you're going to have. Don't worry about how you're going to do it. That's going to come. You're going to develop a plan of action. You will find the way. You'll become the kind of person that can attract the people, the resources, and everything you need in order to make that become reality. But I want you to be mindful of your inner conversation. I remember once I was sitting in an audience and Zig Ziglar, who I consider one of the greatest motivational speakers on the planet, he was giving a speech and I was out in the audience and I saw him going back and forth and within myself I said, I'd like to do that. I can do that. And I leaned over to the guy next to me. I said, how much do they pay him to do that? And he said, $5,000. I said, I know I can do that. <laughs> and I admired him. And then 
On the way home, when I was driving from Tampa, Florida, back to Miami, Florida, my inner conversation kicked in, and it said, Les Brown, you can't do that. You don't have a college education. Les Brown, you can't do that. You don't have the money. You don't have the contacts. You've never worked for a major corporation. What makes you think that you can make more in one hour talking than you've made working for a whole month? Now, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever thought about something you wanted to do, and you talk you out of it? Raise your hand, please. That inner conversation, ladies and gentlemen, is the reason that most people take their greatness, take their ideas to the graveyard with them. You know, the wealthiest place on the planet, a minister said recently, and it was so true, is not the gold mines in the various areas of the world or the diamond mines. The wealthiest place on the planet is the graveyard. Because in the graveyard, we will find inventions that we never, ever were exposed to. Ideas, dreams that never became reality, hopes and aspirations that were never acted upon. Because most people allow that inner conversation, for whatever reason, to keep them from ever pursuing their goals. So let us begin to look at what's required in order to, to make this our decade. Why is it that most people don't ever reach their goals or live up to their true potential? One is fear. And there are only two kinds of fears that we're born with. The fear of falling and the fear of a loud sound. All other fears we learn, like the fear of failure. The next is the fear of success. That's one of the major challenges I had to deal with. I was working on a major project. And after it began to grow and it was extremely successful, I panicked. And I walked away from it and gave it to someone else because I didn't believe that I could handle it. The other thing that keeps most people from reaching their goals is that a lot of people become comfortable. They stop growing, they stop wanting anything, they, they become satisfied. They stop looking at ways in which they can approve themselves, they stop putting things in front of them. I was reading something by a great man, George Bernard Shaw, and he said something to the effect that to have succeeded is to have finished one's business on earth. Like the male spider who is killed by the female spider the moment he has succeeded in his courtship. And he goes on to say, I like a state of continual becoming with a goal in front and not behind. I remember after giving a speech at a major corporation, a gentleman came up to me who was up in years and he said, you know, that's real great motivation for you young guys. But I've done all my work. There's nothing else for me to do. I said, oh, yes. You've got a lot to give. You have a lot to offer. The fact that you're still here means that your business is not through yet. The other thing that keeps us from reaching our goal is not feeling worthy. That's where a lot of people get stuck. Because, see, when you don't feel worthy of your goal, you will begin to unconsciously engage in self-destructive behavior like procrastinating constantly putting things off squandering your time and that's what life is made of something else that keeps us from reaching our goal and that is many times because we spend so much time complaining and blaming everybody or everything I'm reminded of a friend of mine who talked about the fact that one day he was walking by this house and, and some people were sitting on a porch and there was a dog on the porch and this dog was just moaning and groaning. So he was curious and he asked the owner, he said, why is this dog moaning and groaning? And the owner said, because he's laying on a nail. <laughs> he said, well, why doesn't he get off? He said, it's not hurting bad enough for him to get off. <laughs>